Chapter 132, Seventh Year, Victims There was howling, whining, scents, animals, magic, mould. He had to get out, hunt, pack, the pack. The big one tried to stop him. The black one tackled him, but he had to get out. He was so hungry. So hungry. Remus! Remus! Wake up! His eyes snapped open as Cyril shook him roughly by the shoulders. What? Are you okay? He was lying on his back on the dusty shack floor. He was bleeding, but he didn't know where from. Sirius was bleeding too. Remus tried to sit up and winced as his head rattled and his back creaked. What happened? He gasped, throat raw from howling or screaming. Here. Sirius helped him up and over to the bed. He pulled out a goblet. Remus didn't know where he'd got it and whispered, Aquamenti. Cyrus's hands were shaking as water poured from his wand, and he handed it to Remus, who drank greedily, spilling it down his front. He knew something was wrong. He could smell the blood and the fear and the sunrise, but it was taking longer than usual for his human thoughts to come back to him, like waking up still drunk with a hangover to boot. What happened? he asked again, frowning. Are you hurt? It's fine. Ciro shook his head. He looked very pale, not his usual aristocratic self, but sickly, worried, yellowish with sweat. You just nipped me a few times. You kept trying to get out. Did I? Remus grabbed him suddenly, pulling his shirt. Sirius pushed him down gently, reaching for the blankets to cover him with. He shook his head. No, we kept you here. You never left. I promise you. Where are the others? They had to go. Madame Pomfrey will be here soon. When you turned back it was different. Harder than normal, I think. You wouldn't wake up properly. So James left me with the cloak. I didn't want to leave you here. Remus lay back, his mind racing. He tried to remember, but it was all scrambled up. He only knew one thing for sure. Something really bad happened, he whispered. His own voice was trembling now, and cold dread settled in his stomach like a sickness. Cyrus didn't say anything. He just squeezed his hand. He hid under his cloak as soon as Madame Pomfrey arrived, and she hurried in, with a terrible grey look on her own face. He sat up, every muscle screaming at him. Poppy! he rasped. What happened? Please tell me. How are you first? she asked, coming over to feel his forehead. You're running very high. I feel fine, he lied, batting her hand away impatiently. There was an attack, wasn't there? She nodded her head wordlessly. His heart thumped. Who? How many? I don't know, she said very quietly. He had never heard that voice come out of her before. For a moment, she wouldn't even meet his eyes. She had always looked him in the eye. Please, he said again. She shook her head very slightly. There's nothing I can tell you. It'll be in the morning news. I have to see Dumbledore. He's not here. She stood up. Now, can you walk? Professor McGonagall says you're to go to your lessons as usual, if you're fit enough. We don't want anyone asking where you are. I'll give you something for the pain. They walked through the tunnel in silence, with Sirius behind them still invisible. Madame Pomfrey dealt with the worst of his scratches, mostly from Padfoot, though fortunately she assumed he'd done them to himself and told him to carry on about his day. He took the potion she gave him, but his head still throbbed and his body ached. As soon as she had turned a corner, Sirius revealed himself and slid an arm around Remus's back. Why are you pretending you're okay? He hissed, supporting Remus up the stairs back to their dorm. You can barely walk. I'll be fine in a minute, Remus replied, gritting his teeth. She's got enough to worry about. Ugh, fucking stairs. James said he'd send an owl to his dad right away, Sirius said, as they slowly ascended the marble staircase. If anyone knows what's happened, the Potters will. (sighs) Yeah, Remus nodded, wheezing. Good. But he knew that it was all no good. Whatever had happened, had happened, and it had been just as awful as Castor promised. It was the end of any chance of civility for the werewolves. Back in the dorm room, James was still waiting for a reply from his parents. Remus sat down on his bed, heavily, chest heaving, every part of him aching, 
his skin on fire. You could just bunk off, Sirius said awkwardly, glancing at the others. We do it all the time. Rumor shook his head. He hauled himself up, clutching the bed frame. Can't risk it. We've got arithmancy first. Snape's in that. And if the papers are full of werewolf's attacks, and I'm not there, what do you want to bet he'll be the first to start stirring? I'm going for a shower. Just a minute. He could hear the other three marauders whispering loudly through the bathroom door, but he hadn't the energy to focus on anything except getting through the next six hours. He turned on the taps and let the hissing water drown them out. Werewolf attacks. Magical community demands action. Hundreds were affected by a string of brutal werewolf attacks during last night's full moon, which left 15 wizards dead and at least five missing, presumed kidnapped. None of the creatures responsible have been identified as yet, and the Aura's office had advised everyone to be on high alert and to consult the published ministry guidelines on identifying and approaching werewolves, which are classified five X's and considered highly dangerous. The Interim Minister for Magic has been criticised for failure to maintain the werewolf register, established by Newt's commander in 1947. Speaking for the opposition, Abraxas Malfoy released a statement in the early hours of this morning. Last night's attacks are further proof that the Ministry is in dire need of reform, and on behalf of the ancient and law-abiding magical families of Great Britain, we demand stricter sanctions on half-humans and other undesirable and potentially dangerous elements. This statement has provoked outrage in what insides are describing as an increasingly divided ministry. No names, James muttered darkly. That's not good. Protecting the victims' families? Sirius suggested. Since when has the Daily Prophet cared about that? Lily hissed venomously. Since when is the ministry? Careful what you say, Peter whispered, his eyes wide. My cousin who works at the Prophet said they're being sent really strict guidelines on what they can write about the ministry, the war, anything. And there are spies everywhere checking on them, making sure no one's being too critical. This made everyone go quiet, and Lily looked around nervously, glancing over her shoulder. It didn't matter. Everyone in the Great Hall seemed to be talking about the same thing, huddled in groups over newspapers, whispering among themselves. It's not as if we're disagreeing with what the paper says, Marlene whispered, leaning forward. I hate Malfoy's politics as much as the next half-blood, but he's right about the failures of the register. The werewolves need to be contained, or stuff like this will happen, Dark Lord or not. (laughs) That's ridiculous, Sirius scoffed. An organised attack like this only happens when there's someone behind it. This would never happen without Voldemort goading them. Everyone winced as he said the name. Rumours had noticed this happening more and more, as the list of missing people grew and people trusted each other less. They're still dangerous, Marlene replied. I don't see why we're pretending they aren't. It says right here. She jabbed the black and white print. Classified 5X. I know it's unfortunate for them. They might have been perfectly normal otherwise, but facts are facts. No one said anything to that. Rumours doing his best to ignore all of them. He was busy writing a letter to Professor Firox who was the only person he could think of who had been in potential danger last night. Livia knew him. He had attacked her once, and rumours thought she seemed like the sort of person to hold a grudge. Besides, writing gave him something to distract himself from how awful he felt, aching and shivery all over. He knew he looked awful too, and thought it best to keep his head down. She doesn't know what she's talking about, Lily whispered to him on their way out of the hall. Miles just sees everything as black and white. Don't take it personally. (sighs) I don't, Remus replied tiredly. I'm fine. Don't worry about me. Still, he was dreading care of magical creatures later that morning, when he'd have to sit next to Marlene. He'd cast a glamour to cover up his newer scars, and was sipping on a pepper-up potion as if it was keeping him alive, but he couldn't hide the fact that he was utterly exhausted not to mention the bone-crushing guilt he felt over the attacks. He'd known they were going to happen. He'd told Dumbledore, but it hadn't been enough. He ought to have done more. Arithmancy wasn't too bad. He had Sirius, James and Lily in that, and they formed a protective huddle around him, taking their seats at the back of the class. The exercises were almost impossible to do. Remus found his mind oddly fractured, unable to hold down a thought for very long. 
James and Sirius fell into their usual clownish mischief, creating a satisfactory distraction any time the teacher glanced up at Remus. He was so grateful, especially as they had both been up all night too. Afterwards, Sirius walked him to care of magical creatures, as he had a free hour, and Remus hadn't the energy to refuse. The hallways were too busy for him to risk leaning on the other boy for support, so they just went slowly. Just bunk off, Sirius pleaded, watching him struggle down the third flight of stairs. You've shown your face. Snivellus has seen you. Remus just shook his head, carrying on doggedly. As he reached the bottom, a couple of third-year boys rushed past, shouting at each other and laughing. One of them bumped into Remus with his bag, which would have been nothing on a good day, but at that moment was exactly the wrong thing and knocked Remus sideways into the banister. He bit his lip as the left side of his body hit the hard stone. He couldn't help but let out a gasp of pain. Citric corpus! Sirius yelled, pulling out his wand and firing the hex at all three boys. They yelped as the marble staircases turned to quicksand beneath them and began to swallow them up. Sirius only stopped it when their legs were dangling through the bottom and they were trapped halfway. Watch where you're going, he said menacingly, before helping Remus down the last few steps. No one intervened, no one ever did when it was Sirius, and Remus was too focused on getting to his lesson on time. Promise me you'll go back and free them, he asked as they neared the classroom. I don't need you getting into tension on top of everything. If someone hasn't found them already, Sirius shrugged, I only taught them a lesson. Any prefect would have done the same. Remus usually would have found that funny, but he felt as though he was wading through quicksand too, his limbs heavy and slow, everything around him foggy and blurred. Right, Sirius was saying. I'll be back here in an hour to get you. I don't need collecting. I'm not a child, Remus muttered. No, Sirius squeezed his hand very quickly. You're my Mooney. He made a mental note to save that up for later when he was alone, and could bask in the thought of being serious as anything. Just now, though, he hated himself too much to allow anyone to be kind. Care of magical creatures was worse than he could have imagined. His temperature was running even higher from the exertion, and he had to keep wiping sweat from his eyes, hair sticking to his forehead. Despite breakfast having only been an hour earlier, his stomach felt like an empty cavern, growling intermittently. His head ached and his vision swam, but he sat bolt upright, staring fixedly at the blackboard. They were supposed to be doing dragons, identifying the various species and their individual properties. Kettleburn began the lesson as he always did, with a terrifying and usually harrowing story of an encounter he'd had with whichever creature they were discussing. Today was no different, and the battle-scarred professor was in his element today. He had lost two limbs to dragons. Despite his animated tale, only half of the class was actually paying attention. You could tell by the look of faint horror on their faces as they scribbled down notes. The other half, Marlene and Mary included, was busy reading the chapter in their textbooks which concerned werewolves. There's something a bit sexy about the whole beast-man thing, though, Mary whispered across to Remus, who began to feel light-headed. Mary! Marlene hissed angrily. That's completely insensitive. People died. I'm just saying... You wouldn't think that, anyway, if you met a real one. I spoke to Cyan Bolsh over the summer. She left last year for healer training, and she's been shadowing healer on the lycanthropy ward at St Mungo's. They have awful hygiene, most of them, because they can't live near normal wizards, and they basically live off handouts and charity. Well, I feel sorry for them, Mary snapped back. That sounds horrible. Wizards are so heartless. You're being deliberately dense. They're not safe. Excuse me, Professor Kettleburn? The whole class turned to see McGonagall standing in the doorway. Remus's stomach dropped. Had she come for him? Had the Ministry finally come for him? The head of the Gryffindor house looked very grave and was holding a letter in her hand. But she did not look at Remus. I am sorry to interrupt. Marlene McKinnon, may I speak to you? Marlene frowned and stood up, setting her quill back into the inkwell. She threw a confused glance back at Mary and Remus, before following Professor McGonagall out of the room. The door closed, and everyone stared at it in silence. She can't be in trouble, Mary whispered to Remus. She's too goody-goody. Remus mumbled something, but his hunger had turned into queasiness, and he didn't want to open his mouth. 
He wished he could take off his cloak. The room was so stuffy and hot, he was getting uncomfortably damp under his armpits and across his back. Are you all right, sweetheart? Mary asked, her face concerned. You look like you're going to puke. Is it Kettleburn's horrid stories? Mm hmm. Remus nodded very slightly, shooting pains fisting up his neck as he did so. He rested his forehead in his hands, hoping he just looked like he was really interested in his notes. There was no room for Mary to probe him any more, though. A horrible shriek sounded outside the classroom, followed by a chilling moan of absolute despair. Mary was on her feet at once and flew out of the room to see her friend. Remus caught only a glimpse as the door swung open and shut, of Marlene on her knees, sobbing, and McGonagall bent over her, patting her shoulders. Even Kettleburn was rendered mute for a few minutes, before regaining his composure and clearing his throat. <clears throat> We're living in difficult times, he said, quite out of character. I urge you all to be kind to each other, especially as you prepare to leave Hogwarts. The lesson continued after that, much subdued, and it took all of Remus's concentration to stay conscious in his seat, now that he was alone on his desk. About fifteen minutes before the class was due to end, there was a second knock at the door. Enter! Kettleburn barked. The door opened, and Lily walked in. Good morning, Professor. I've just come to collect Marlene's things for her. Kettleburn nodded and gestured at Marlene's desk, where her work was still spread out, her book bag hanging off the back of her chair. Lily went over and quickly started gathering things together. She took one look at Remus and raised her head. Sorry, Professor. May I ask Remus to come with me? I didn't realise Mary left all of her bits too. Of course, of course. Kettleburn nodded distractedly, labelling a diagram of dragon's lairs on the board. Chapter 18 to 25 for next lesson, please, Mr Lupin. Yes, sir. Remus croaked, picking up Mary's bags. Thank God it wasn't heavy, and thank God for Lily Evans. As soon as they were outside in the corridor, Remus leaned heavily against the wall and closed his eyes. Oh, Remus, Lily said anxiously, raising a cool hand to his forehead. You look dreadful. I'm fine, he mumbled, uselessly, eyes still shut. Just give me a second. It is Marlene. She's gone home. Lily lowered her voice, though they were quite alone. Her brother, Danny, was attacked last night. St. Mungo started releasing names. Remus's head swam. He opened his eyes only to see black spots and closed them again, in case he fainted. Is he? He's alive, but it doesn't sound very good. The guilt was overwhelming, roaring in Remus's ears. How would he ever look Marlene in the eye again? Come on. Lily took his arm and draped it over her shoulder. She fitted very snugly, but he didn't dare lean on her too much. I'm taking you to the tower. You're in no state for school. I'll say you're helping me pack for Marlene. Someone ought to tell... He was about to say Yasmin, but realised that it was still a secret. Uh, uh, Madame Pomfrey. He finished lamely. Marlene's going to miss healing lessons. I'm sure she already knows, Lily replied briskly. Come along now. She was a lot harder to refuse than Sirius. Chapter 133 Seventh Year Sunday Afternoon Sunday the 29th of January, 1978 Mooney! Hmm? It's after midday. So? I thought you might fancy getting up. No thanks. Can I come in? No. Oh, okay then. Sirius began to walk away, and Remus's stomach flipped. I'm sorry, he said, loud enough for Sirius to hear and stop. Remus finally crawled out of the covers. I do want you here, I just don't know what to say. He could hear Sirius fidgeting, his hands in his pockets, then running through his hair. Finally. We don't have to talk. Remus sighed. He was a mess. He hadn't washed properly since Wednesday, and had only got out of bed to use the bathroom. The other boys had been feeding him by passing food through the crack in his curtains, and if they hadn't, Remus wasn't so sure he'd have eaten at all. He was in the worst state he'd ever been in, but he missed Sirius. Okay, then. The curtain parted, and Remus scowled against the bright daylight, but Sirius crawled in quickly, closing them again. He looked at Remus, 
but he didn't look too hard before shuffling down next to him and enveloping him in his arms. Thanks, he breathed against Remus's hair, for letting me in. Reckon I must stink. Sirius inhaled deeply, tickling Remus's forehead and making him squirm. Nope, just smell like Mooney. <laughs> Get off, you mutt. Remus wriggled away from him. Feel like getting up soon? Everyone's worried. And they're looking at me now, like I know what to do, because everyone knows about us, which is weird, and quite a lot of pressure, really. Remus chuckled, and it felt strange but good. Still, he had a melancholic episode to maintain. I still don't feel like getting up. Okay, but then you need to let me hide in here with you, because I'm not going back out there. Serious. Remus. Sirius frowned at him, exaggerating his eyebrows to look stupid. Stop it. Remus folded his arms, aware he was starting to sound like a sulky child. I will not. Sirius poked him in the ribs. Come on, I know you're feeling like shit about everything, but did you ever consider that it's not for you to hog all of the misery like this? That maybe if you talk to your friends, it might not all seem quite so bleak. Remus frowned at him, arms still crossed. Maybe that works for you. Are you saying this is working for you? Remus pressed his lips together. They stared each other out for a minute. Remus began to think he'd quite like to fight Sirius right now, like they did on full moons, just because it was a fun way to expel energy. Then he noticed something. He sniffed the air. <laughs> Are you bleeding? I can smell blood. Probably you, from the moon. No, I've healed already. I never have open wounds longer than a day. <laughs> Bloody hell, Sirius laughed lightly. How is it possible for you to get any cooler? And it's your blood, I can tell. There you go again, you're basically a superhero. Sirius. Okay, okay, he sat up, running his hands through his hair. You swiped at me a few times over the moon, I told you that. We did it to each other. And you can't turn me when I'm a dog, we've tested that enough times. But you're still bleeding. It was almost a week ago. You need to go to Madame Pomfrey. Oh yeah, and say my werewolf boyfriend scratched me while I was in dog form as an illegal animagus. Oh, Jesus. Remus groaned, hauling himself up and out of bed, grabbing Sirius by the wrist and pulling him along. Where are we going? I need better light. He yanked open the bathroom door and slammed down the lid of the toilet. Sit, he instructed. Sirius complied, half-smiling. Remus opened the little mirror cabinet above the sink, digging out merlap essence and disinfectant and gall and cotton balls. He had found over the years of trial and error that a combination of magical and muggle things worked best, as with almost everything. He pulled his wand out of his pyjama bottoms and stood in front of Sirius. Okay, show me. Sirius dropped his head, no longer enjoying Remus's newfound motivation. He sighed heavily and lifted his shirt, saying, It's not that bad. It wasn't as bad as Remus had feared, but it still made his stomach clench when he saw. Three dark red stripes across Sirius's ribs. They were starting to heal, but he knew he could fix it fairly easily. He took a deep breath, met Sirius's eye, then reached for the disinfectant, then his wand. Remus was pretty good at healing cuts now and the scab and the redness were gone in an instant. Now they were white stripes. I'm so sorry, he said mournfully. It was a magical wound. You'll have a scar there for the rest of your life now. Sirius looked down at the mark, then up again. That's fine, Remus, he said quietly. So, Remus rejoined the group at Sirius's goading, and they were all kind enough to pretend he had merely been unwell and not avoiding them. The news over the past few days had been particularly grim. First the Prophet had published a list of the dead and their photographs, then they had published a list of those presumed bitten along with their photographs, which had provoked outcry among some of the more liberal commentators, and ignited a debate on mandatory registration for all werewolves. Greyback's name had not been mentioned, nor any other werewolves that Remus was aware of, it was as if the horrific crimes had simply happened one night, and the assailants had vanished into thin air. No one had heard from Marlene either, 
though Danny McKinnon was one of those named on the papers. He had been given a full four inches of text by virtue of his celebrity status as beta for the Chudley Cannons. The team's manager was interviewed and quoted saying that while he had not yet been briefed on the details of Danny's condition, the Cannons operated a zero-tolerance policy to half-breeds and dangerous creatures and would deal to any allegations of infection accordingly. James vowed that he would never see a Chudley Cannons game again, but rumours mostly felt sorry for Danny. They tried to put all of this misery behind them and went down for Sunday lunch. And thank goodness, it was generally Remus' favourite meal of the week and he'd have been even more blue if he'd missed it. Then, they spent the rest of the evening cosied up in the common room in front of the fire. Remus even agreed to a chess game with Peter, who was thrilled. You know what we ought to start getting serious about? Sirius mused, sorting through his record collection. Newts? Remus asked, hopefully, as Peter captured his knight. Job applications? Lily said, from the armchair, where she sat in James's lap, reading a magazine. The Quidditch Cup? James suggested. For goodness sake, Sirius tutted. I'm ashamed to call you all marauders. What? All three of them frowned, offended. Peter chuckled. He's talking about the big prank on Slytherin. You know we started planning it before Christmas. Wormy boy, you are without a doubt my very favourite person. Sirius grinned broadly. Peter snorted. <laughs> Bugger off. And promptly captured Remus's queen. Ugh, I don't know why I bother. I haven't beaten you since I was thirteen. Remus sighed, leaning back on the rug on his elbows. He looked up at Sirius. Well then, got a plan? Maybe... Whatever we do, I think we should focus the attack on the dungeons. Let's not throw around words like attack, Lily said hurriedly. This is just a practical joke, right? In the wholesome spirit of harmless house rivalry. If you like, Sirius shrugged, half ignoring the interjection. Anyway, Mooney, I thought your study group was in on this. What's the point in you having all these minions if you can't make them work for you? <laughs> oh my god. For the last time, they're not my minions. Remus rolled his eyes. Anyway, we've not had a proper study group yet this term. I've been ever so slightly busy. Well, as none of us are scheduled to be in mortal peril for the next month or so, Cyrus replied, I think we ought to get cracking. Everyone could do with a laugh, yeah? Assemble the troops, and we'll meet sometime next week. Oh, as long as it doesn't clash with Quidditch. James yawned. I'm there. Right, I'm off to bed. Transfiguration first thing. The others all glanced up at the clock, or began to yawn themselves, and agreed to follow suit. The common room was clearing out now, anyway, and they were some of the last to leave. Remus had got his pyjamas on, and brushed his teeth, when he remembered that he'd left his book downstairs. While that didn't usually matter, this particular book was Maurice, by E. M. Forster, and though the cover was nondescript, he was a bit concerned that if someone picked it up and read the blurb, there would be raised eyebrows. Sighing, he left the bathroom and hurried downstairs, muttering, Get in my book, to Sirius, who was next in the queue. He had just grabbed the book and was about to head back up when he heard the portrait hole slide open. He turned to see Mary enter. She was wearing a short, sprangly silver dress and she tripped on her way in, but caught herself giggling. All right, he called to her. She looked up squinting, a bit in the dim light. Hiya, sexy, she grinned, wandering in, a bit unsteady on her feet. Might have been the four-inch heels she was wearing, or it might have been the witch's brew Remus could smell wafting off her. Hi, been somewhere? He walked back towards the couches, wanting to make sure she was all right before leaving. <sighs> she waved a hand, collapsing into the nearest armchair, spreading her legs out. Her short dress rode up her thighs. But she didn't seem bothered. Just a few drinks in the Raven Claw common room. Thought you were seeing a Hufflepuff. Hmm, he was there. She exhaled, smiling, tilted her head back and closed her eyes. The lids were painted gold, finely rimmed with coal. She looked like an Egyptian queen in a party frock. But a lot of people were there, I suppose. She sounded sad. Remus sat down in the armchair opposite her, clutching the book in his lap. Are you okay, Mary? 
Hmm, fine. She opened her eyes slowly and smiled at him. She wasn't that drunk, he realised, but she looked tired and deeply unhappy. Just stuff on my mind, boys being wankers and poor Marlene. Have you heard from her? Mary shook her head, then sat up, blinking. Haven't got a fag, have you, sweetheart? I don't usually, but I just really fancy one. Yeah. Remus reached in his pockets for his matchbox, where he kept the cigarettes he had rolled himself. He slid it open. Normal or fun? Ooh, fun, please. She purred, reaching over. Might help me sleep. Um, about Marlene, Remus said, lighting his own. I, um, just had a thought. Uh, y- you know her friend Yaz? H- have you seen her about? I wasn't sure if anyone told her. I did, Mary said, exhaling, watching Remus through the smoke beneath her heavy golden eyelids. I told her. Oh, Remus blinked in surprise. That's good then. Hmm. I thought she'd better know, Mary mused, pulling a strand of her hair and winding it coyly round her little finger. I didn't want her to think Miles had gone cold on her. Remus took a quick, sharp puff on his cigarette frowning very slightly. What do you mean? Mary laughed, arching back in her chair, showing her pearly white teeth. She let the curl of hair spring back into place like a corkscrew. Oh, come on, Remus. She shook her head. I know. You... She told you. No, Mary conceded, settling back down with a sigh. But I'm not thick. Despite rumours to the contrary... At least I know what romance looks like. She arched her eyebrow. I'm not as dense as James, for example. How long did he take to figure it out? He doesn't know about Marlene, Remus replied. They must keep it quiet during Quidditch stuff. I'm not talking about Marlene now. I'm talking about you. Me? He's a good kisser, isn't he? She winked at him. But then... You were too, I seem to remember. How? Hmm. I've suspected for a little while now. Just little things. All the time you spend together. Him being single for more than five minutes. I wasn't a hundred percent sure, but you've just confirmed it for me. (laughs) Bugger. She laughed again, a friendly, thrilling sound. Silly boy. She smiled affectionately, playing with her hair again as she smoked. She looked at him again her eyes more focused. When she spoke, her voice was more serious than normal. It's fine if you want to keep quiet. I was going to wait to see if you told me yourself, like I'm doing with Mars, but I just wanted to let you know I've got this reputation for being a bit of a big mouth, but I can keep a secret, okay? Especially for my friends. And if... She bit her lip. If there's anything else you're keeping a secret, Remus... Then you can trust me, okay? It doesn't change anything. This was almost too many revelations for one evening. Rumor sucked hard on his cigarette and half wished he'd opted for a spliff too. What are you saying? He asked very carefully. Do you think you know something else? Remus, she sat up. The scars? Being ill every full moon? We do the same Care of Magical Creatures class. You can't tell anyone, Remus said, his voice very low, even though he knew they were completely alone. Please, Mary. Me and Sirius, that's one thing, but this... I could get kicked out of school. I could get arrested. Hey! Mary stood up quickly and came over to sit on the arm of his chair. I'm not going to tell. That's what I'm trying to explain. She wound an arm round his shoulder. Makes no difference to me, I swear. Really? Honestly. She kissed his cheek and gave him a squeeze. So, don't take what happened to Marlene's brother so hard, yeah? It was nothing to do with you. She'd never forgive me if she knew, Remus said sadly. Mary handed him what was left of her joint and he puffed on it gratefully. Don't worry about that, she said flippantly. She'll come around. She knows who you really are. And maybe you could help. You could write to Danny, even. 
I bet he could do with a friend. That's... Remus was about to say that while it was a really nice idea, it was almost impossible, considering the fact he was unregistered, and it would be a bad idea to draw attention to himself. Mooney, where are you? Sirius's voice came clattering down the stairs. I can smell the pot all the way from here. You're not being subtle. Oh, hiya, MacDonald. Black? Mary nodded, still perched on the arm of Remus's chair. Sorry, I'm trying to seduce your boyfriend. Oh yeah, I'd like to see you... Wait, my what? She just poked out her tongue at him. He looked at Remus. Are we telling everyone now? Oi! Mary hopped off the seat. I'm not everyone, arrogant tosser. Don't forget, I had you both first. Remus couldn't help laughing at the look on Sirius's face and got out of the chair sheepishly, still clutching Maurice. Sorry, I'll come up now. We were just chatting. He looked back at Mary. Will you be okay? Fine, she nodded, smiling. I'm off to bed too. Night, lads. Good night. Back upstairs in the warm glow of their dorm room, Peter was already snoring softly behind his curtains, and James was sitting cross-legged on his bed, flipping through his Quidditch notebook. Thought we'd lost you, Mooney, he whispered cheerily as the two boys entered. Bumped into Mary. She's been at some party with the Ravenclaws. See, this is what happens when you get stuck with the head boy and head girl in your house, Sirius sighed, leaning back on his own bed. All the fun happens elsewhere. No, oh, stop whinging. James grinned, closing his book. We'll have more parties and you know it. Now go to bed like a good boy. Oh, fine. Sirius yawned, falling backwards dramatically, so that he disappeared through the heavy velvet hangings. Good night then. Rumor started, making for his own bed. But Sirius's hand shot out and grabbed his wrist. Mooney he whispered softly from the shadows behind the veil. Remus bit his lip and glanced over at James, who looked away awkwardly and began to draw his own bed curtains across. Oh well, fuck it. Hmm, okay. Remus let Sirius pull him inside. End of chapter 133